All right, everybody, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Bob Trug. I'm the director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School and an and, and intensive care physician at uh, Children's Hospital. And I'm going to introduce uh, Aaron, and then I'll have him introduce our panel and the topic. So um, welcome. This is uh, part of our series on policy and ethics. I'll say more about that in a moment. Let me first tell you a little bit about Aaron. So Aaron Kesselheim is an associate professor of medicine here at Harvard Medical School. He's in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics uh, in the Department of Medicine at the Brigham. And there he heads the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law, which is known as the Portal Program. Aaron is also a faculty member of our Center for Bioethics here, uh, where he uh, teaches in our courses and, importantly, organizes and runs um, this series of seminars. And let me just say a word about what the, uh, the center's been doing around uh, these consortiums. So we've been ramping up this year, but in the fall, starting in the fall, we should have uh, something happening in this time slot, 1230 to 2, almost every Friday. So first Fridays of the month, we'll have the Clinical Ethics Consortium, where we will, uh, the hospitals come and present a difficult case from their ethics committees, commentary, and um, discussion about that. That's our oldest running series. We've been doing that now for more than 25 years. Um, second Fridays uh, will be on um, uh, research ethics, and this is a new series we're starting working with the IRBs throughout the Harvard system. Uh, third Fridays will be the policy and ethics seminar series that Aaron will be running, and on fourth Fridays we have a series on organizational ethics. So. Um, it's all a way of saying I would hope that beginning in the fall, you'll just mark out these times on Fridays and come and get a free lunch and, uh, and participate in our discussion about topics on ethics. Um, so with that, uh, Aaron, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the others and the, and the panel today. Great. Thanks, Bob. So um, just as a follow-on to that, we, if you register for today, we have your, we have your uh, email address so that we can keep you informed about the topics. Um, and the, and the speakers that we're going to have starting in September. Um, but if you're here and you didn't register, please come see me so I can get your email address so we can make sure we, um, we directly alert you to, to uh, your interest in this. And, but but um, thanks for coming today. Um, so our conversation today is about building a biomedical information commons. Um, and I just want to present a few sort of introductory slides um, to kind of uh, whet your appetite for our um, three distinguished guests who will uh, talk in more detail about it. So um, this, is a, uh, this shows um, of the uh, over 15,000 patents granted in the United States um, that contain composition of matter claims to simple nucleic acid molecules. Um, about two-thirds are assigned to private sector or business assignees, um, and about a quarter um, on the top there have public sector assignees, um, and then there is a, a smaller number um, in the yellow, where uh, I'm sorry, in the green, where it's sort of a combination of both, um, and as you can see in the two in the two other um, figures um, B and C, that the numbers overall have been fairly consistent um, over the over the last uh, um, couple of decades, um, in terms of uh, ownership of of gene patents and. So our, our, our conversation today is going to be about ownership of, of genes and genetic material and gene patents um, and the effects uh, that those can have on, um, on healthcare delivery and on research um, and, um, and this, this sort of idea of, of a commons as a, as a solution and what some of the parameters are of that solution. Um, this just again to, to sort of bring home the point that, that these things have a you know substantial effect on can have a substantial effect on patient care. This was a survey from about a decade ago of U.S. lab directors performing DNA-based genetic tests, and as you can see on the first line is they asked the lab directors you know has the effects of gene uh, of patents uh, made testing more or less accessible to patients, um, and the sort of 90 percent of them indicated that. Um, it had a negative effect, including, you know, reducing access to testing. Um, Ninety-six percent of them indicated that it increased the cost uh, of the test. And so, you know, these things have real and direct um, implications on, um, uh, on patient care. So um, there's a spectrum of, of access that different um, 
uh, bodies have set up in terms of the extent to which they share uh, gene patent, their, the patents on genes and their genetic material and provide a basis for a common. So on one end of the spectrum is a fully closed access model. And one example of this we'll, that we'll talk more about uh, today is the Myriad genetics um, case. So um, Myriad um, uh, was organized around patents related to um, uh, the BRCA1 and 2 uh, genetic testing for, uh, for breast cancer um, risk. Um, and uh, Myriad sought patent protection for, for both methods of detecting and comparing the DNA sequence variations for the isolated DNA molecules, um, and then commercialized the BRAC analysis test. Um, and, uh, and, now, and now claims that it has, you know, dozens of patents with 500 claims relating to, the, relating to the field itself. And there have been objections raised by public health advocates about Myriad's restrictions on uses of its genes in the context of research um, and its refusal to allow independent confirmatory testing of ambiguous, uh, ambiguous test results. Um, and over the last 20 years, since Myriad first grabbed these, these um, patents, it's built up its own proprietary library of BRCA mutations. Um, and um, we can talk about some of the implications of this uh, library of mutations being proprietary. But for example, um, you know, one study found that the BRAC analysis test was lacking um, among 12 percent of women with a high um, with a certain high risk that, uh, uh, of breast cancer genes that were not included in the test, but there was no way uh, of trying to develop tests around it. And this led to um, some legal challenges to their patents on the, on the gene itself that were ended up being um, overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, moving further along on the spectrum is the, the database of genotypes and phenotypes, which was uh, a sort of a mildly open access model. It was developed to archive and distribute data on the results of studies that have investigated the interaction of genotype and phenotype in humans. So the National Center for, for Biotechnology Information um, created the dbGaP public repository for individual level phenotype exposure genotype and sequence data um, and associations between them. And there's a public interface that allows users to browse and search the metadata. Um, phenotype variable summary information, documentation. And then if, if you're a researcher and you want uh, more individual level data, then you have to apply through a relatively, what I, what I uh, per, uh, perceive as being a relatively rigorous process to receive authorization for access. Um, and then on the sort of other end of the spectrum is a sort of um, very open access model. So the Personal Genome Project, or PGP, was founded in 2005, and it's dedicated to creating a public genome um, uh, of health and, and trait data to accelerate research into human health and biology by collecting and sharing genomes and other data from people who have chosen to donate their data to the public domain. So privacy, confidentiality, anonymity are basically impossible to guarantee, um, and they, they sort of work directly with patients so that patients understand that they're, um, that what the implications are of their, um, of their sharing their data with virtually anyone um, who, who, wants to, who wants to see it. Um, but, you know, on the, on the other hand, the goal of, of trying to make a valuable and lasting contribution to science. And then there are some hybrid models out there, and I think we're also going to talk a little bit about the, the 23andMe model as well. So the statement of issue for today's panel um, is that access to large genetic databases can advance the diagnosis and management of genetic diseases. Um, some large databases of variants are held by proprietary companies that control the access to the data. Public databases are racing to catch up, but have been criticized as unreliable, expensive, and vulnerable to funding cuts. Um, in the, uh, meanwhile, in addition, the infrastructure for global sharing is limited, um, and efforts to build a global genomic commons are relatively new. And so in this forum, we'll expo explore the pros and cons of open and proprietary strategies to managing genetic information. And, um, and so now I wanted to introduce our, our three uh, distinguished panelists, and we're very lucky to have them uh, with us today. So our first we're going to hear from Robert Green, who's a medical geneticist and physician scientist um, who genetics, uh, he directs the G2P research program in translational genomics and health outcomes in the Division of Genetics at Brigham Women's Hospital, the Broad Institute, and Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Green currently leads uh, and co-leads the first randomized trials to explore the implementation of medical sequencing in adults and newborns. He co-chairs the steering committee of the NIH Consortium on Clinical Sequencing. Um, exploratory research in the steering committee in the NIH consortium uh, in newborn sequencing in genomic medicine and public health. Um, he's a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee on Evidence Based for Genetic Testing and collaborates on research studies with Illumina, 23andMe, Pathway, and Google. 
Um, he's board certified in neurology and medical genetics and is an associate director of research of partners uh, for Partners Healthcare Personalized Medicine and is a board member of the Council of Responsible Genetics. Um, our second speaker will be Heidi Williams. Heidi received her PhD um, in economics from Harvard University and has been affiliated with, the, uh, with MIT since 2011, where she's currently the class of 1957 career development assistant professor in the Department of Economics. She's also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her research agenda focuses on um, investigating the causes and consequences of technolo technological change in healthcare markets. Um, last year, she was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship uh, in part for uncovering how the timing and nature of intellectual property restrictions affect subsequent innovation. And then finally, um, we have Bob Cook Deegan, um, who's trained as a physician and is a research professor currently in the Stanford School of Public Policy um, at Duke um, with uh, secondary appointments in internal medicine biology. He was the founding director for the Genome Ethics, Law, and Policy in Duke's Institute for in uh, Genome Sciences and Policy. Um, and is the author of uh, The Gene Wars, Science, Politics, and the Human Genome. His area of expertise includes genomics and intellectual property, the history of genomics, global health science, and health policy. Um, and I would say that uh, Bob was also um, my uh, director in my very first job in health policy when I was in law school, and I did a summer um, at the Institute of Medicine where he, where he worked at the time. And obviously, as you'll see, he had a, a, uh, a substantial influence on my career and on my sartorial choices. Um, so, um, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Green. Thank you, Aaron. Well, that was a lovely setting of the stage. I, I think um, Bob Cook Deegan is like uh, Kevin Bacon. We're all, you know, just a few degrees away from each other through him. As you'll hear later, he, uh, he uh, had a big influence on me and in getting me into this area as well. Let's see, do we, do we bring up the slides for, my talk? Should I just maybe see if it's, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, I'm delighted to be here because I don't know much about this topic, and this is a great multidisciplinary opportunity for me to learn more. Uh, my charge is to lay some of the groundwork about where we are and where we're going in genomic medicine, and perhaps uh, lay some framework for the discussion that's going to be followed. Uh, it is important that you know my disclosures, so here they are in terms of my uh, compensated speaking and advisory, and my uncompensated research collaborations with two direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. <clears throat> now, we're in something of a wild west here with genomics at the, at the moment. You know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very exciting. There's new land to explore, and uh, there's a lot of gunfighting going on, and there's a fair amount of uh, snake oil being sold about what exactly genomics can do. I think it's fair to say that that it's a little bit exaggerated in times, and we're all prospecting for that scientific gold. So uh, this is sort of the framework I think we find ourselves in, and I think uh, keeping this in mind as we go forward. Now, I'm going to lay out in this slide a few of the examples of how genomic medicine is going to be used in the future. So one of the ways people have talked about, even Francis Collins starts his talks off this way, is the notion that every baby born will be sequenced and have other omics uh, ev evaluated in order to lay the groundwork for their health for the rest of their life. We're also, of course, already in an era where genomics is being used for the diagnosis of rare conditions. That's happening every day. It would be happening more if we only had better insurance reimbursement for this. <clears throat> One of the low-hanging fruit areas is preconception screening. Why is it today that we are leaving to chance when two people have a baby uh, whether or not they're being preconception tested for the panoply of recessive carrier traits that they might have? I think this is actually, in my own view, one of the very, very potent areas for growth. And of course, we've seen an extraordinary explosion in preconception screening, particularly within IPT, over the last few years. We are already and have been for quite some time doing pre-symptomatic testing in families 
with a genetic diagnosis, classic, the classic dominant and recessive Mendelian conditions, which have traditionally made up the bulk of what a medical geneticist and genetic counselor does. We are dipping our toe in the area of predispositional and population screening. Everybody in this room within a couple of years is going to be offered some special opportunity to be sequenced, and you'll have to decide whether this is an opportunity you want to take advantage of. Of course, we're not going to talk a lot about it today, or at least I'm not, but there is the very fertile area of targeted therapies for cancer and for sort of taking a step back for all of pharmacogenomics. Do we have markers that can tell if we're going to have an adverse effect to a medication before we actually get started on that medication? <clears throat> and of course, new gene variant and treatment discoveries. Uh, when you talk to a certain class of genomic scientists, they uh, really poo-poo a lot of the categories or, that I've laid out on the screen, and they basically say that the registries and th that we are collecting are not there for current medical needs, but are there to discover uh, genes and variants that are associated with common and rare diseases and that will lead us to treatments in the future. Now, there are a lot of cross-currents in the implementation of genomic medicine that are sort of fascinating and sometimes contradictory. So one cross-current is the tradition in genomics of being very concerned about the impact, the negative impact of genomic information. You could say we're the only specialty to be afraid of our own technology. Uh, and yet there is good reason for this. When you have been a genetic counselor or a medical genetist, you sat across the table or the bed from someone on whom you have disclosed uh, the knowledge that they are carrying a variant for Huntington disease or BRCA or that their baby has a particularly impactful genetic condition. These are, can be devastating pieces of information. So while we don't want to be cavalier about this, I think I've often actually been concerned that some of this thinking has held us back from the appropriate implementation of genomic medicine. Another cross current is, of course, direct to consumer everything. It's not really just direct to consumer genomics. It's everything in our society that's moving toward the more empowered self. And in health, that's going to mean the more quantified self. That's x-rays, laboratory tests, and yes, genomics. It can be in the arena of genetic testing along uh, arrays, as it is right now with 23andMe and other direct-to-consumer genetic testings, but very soon it's going to be in the domain of direct-to-consumer sequencing, direct-to-consumer microbiotics, direct-to-consumer gene expression, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> the confluence of money and health care is something I think some of the other speakers are going to get into with far more expertise than I. But it, it is an extraordinary intersection of, of enthusiasm uh, around venture capital, around the start of new companies, around the resistance to um, reimbursement from insurance companies. Almost at every level, uh, we like to stay focused on the scientific aspects of things, but the economic aspects are driving so much of this. And there is, of course, both within the hype and within the hope, there is the notion that we are on the cusp of a true revolution, that, we, that somehow, someday, we're going to change the kind of reactive medicine that we're practicing into a more proactive medicine where we are preventing disease rather than just diagnosing it and chasing it and trying to keep up with it. So all these cross currents are at work. And I guess the question is, for me, as a translational genetic scientist, is how can we gather data that will inform these questions and help us pick our path through this thicket of often conflicting themes? So I'm going to tell you very quickly about some of the research studies we've been conducting. As far back as 2000, we used the paradigm of disclosing APOE for Alzheimer's disease as a paradigm for genetic disclosure. Now let me pause here and ask how many of you, well let's, let's take the big picture first, how many of you have had your own genome sequenced, your entire genome sequenced? Okay, a couple of you there. How many of you have taken advantage of 
direct-to-consumer testing or some other way have had uh, genotyping of some sort. How many of you have learned through that or another mechanism your APOE genotype with, for your risk of Alzheimer's disease? A couple of you. And how many people who have never done any of this would like to know your APOE, which gives you a probabilistic notion of your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? Put your hands way up. That's great because I have a phlebotomist in the back who will be <laughs> greeting you as you leave the building. So this was the basic question we asked starting in uh, now 16 years ago was how many people would want this and what would be their reaction to this fairly scary piece of information where there was then and still is not a preventive treatment to utilize if you learn this information. And I won't go deeply into it except to say that with the help of many collaborators over the years, including Bob Cook Deacon, who was in on this from the beginning, we ran several randomized clinical trials where information, not a pill, was the focus of the trial. And we randomized people to learn their APOE in, in the initial uh, foundational trial or not. And we learned that people who volunteered for this were amazingly well compensated when they learned their information. They were neither more anxious, more distressed. They didn't have more depression. Uh, we would see blips in levels of distress, but these would even out after the first six weeks or few months. And we were able to demonstrate this in our flagship paper. And yet, they were happy they received the information. And they actually tried to do things to change their fate. They changed their vitamins. They changed their exercise. Uh, we're not sure if this worked or not, but it sort of challenged the prevailing notion that nobody does anything with genetic information. And one thing that they clearly did was they reported they were going to purchase more long-term care insurance, which of course makes perfect sense, but then, as it does now, puts uh, insurance companies quite on the defensive. Because of course, if you know something that the insurance company doesn't know, you can game the system a little bit, purchase more insurance if you're at increased risk. And this starts a, what they call a death spiral of adverse selection, whereby you can actually, you meaning all of society, can actually put this entire insurance company out of business. So this is of great concern then when we publish this and continues to be of great concern to insurance companies. And I will say that we've done a lot through the years that uh, I'll just point out some of our recent findings that it turns out that when you add an unanticipated pleiotropic risk information to that APOE, for example, in this case, we just added the, the, the statement that your APOE also tells you something about heart disease. Well, when you add that, the amount of distress and anxiety actually flips. People become less anxious, happier, and more satisfied when they get this information, even if they learned they were at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's like if you give them a second piece of information that gives them something to work on, like I can work on my diet or my exercise, it completely nullifies the distress of the first piece of information. So this was fascinating, and we just recently published this in, in Annals of Internal Medicine. On a completely different note, we've been looking at the way direct-to-consumer companies actually calculate the risk that they give you and the risk that they leave you with. And we've been uncovering some really interesting things about the, the paradigms that the early direct-to-consumer companies, this is Navigenics, this is Decode Me, all compared to 23andMe, and if they were perfectly concordant, they'd all lie along the diagonal line in each one of these graphs. And you can see that, in fact, they are discordant in terms of the risk profiles excuse me, that they give you. So, uh, one of the things we, we believe we're doing is holding companies to a high standard in terms of the kind of ways in which they communicate risk information. <clears throat> we're also do, finding out some fascinating things about direct-to-consumer testing with uh, uh, what people do with when they get direct-to-consumer testing risks for different kinds of cancer. Turns out that how they act after they get that information depends on their perception of their risk. And their perception of their risk is driven by a lot of things, not just what's on the screen in front of them, but whether or not they have a, uh, 
family history of, of a particular type of cancer, whether or not they themselves, for example, smoke. So there's a lot of interesting features that, that help define how people's self-perception of risk is changed by the genetic, genetic message that they receive. And one of the concerns economically that I thought I'd pull out is there's been a great concern about robbing the medical commons. The notion that if you get a bunch of genetic risk information, you're going to go out and order a bunch of tests, which is going to use up society's pool of resources in terms of medicine in ways that really don't make sense and that you're essentially taking away from other more needy areas of, genet of, uh, of, of societal benefit. Well, one of the papers that we just submitted suggests that if you're looking for direct-to-consumer follow-up among the customers, the only thing in the world, I know this is rather small, that predicts whether they go out and tap the healthcare system for screening after they get their own risk is not the message they receive. It's not whether they're at increased risk or decreased risk. It's not whether they're scared of the condition. It's not whether they have a family history of the condition. It is entirely dependent in a multifactorial analysis on whether they happen to go out and get screened in the year before their direct-to-consumer testing. In other words, people who like to get tested use direct-to-consumer testing as another excuse to get tested. And what this suggests is that there's a subset of people who are out there using a lot of medical resources. But it does not necessarily suggest that across the board, personal genomics is going to trigger a lot of unnecessary genetic testing. And this is the first piece of evidence that I'm aware of that's really spoken to this very important criticism of personal genetics. I will just flash through a couple of slides from the REVEAL study in case you're interested in looking up any of these. They're all on our website. <clears throat> and we've tried to paint a coherent picture of what it means to get this piece of scary information, what you perceive, what you cha how your perception changes, and what you do with it. And by the same token, we've had a grant for a few years to study the customers of direct-to-personal, direct-to-consumer personal genetics. We've been publishing steadily on this about confidence, about the impact on what people do with it, about how well they actually understand their findings, about whether what, what, what are the reasons they're going in on doing this, how adoptees view this differently than people uh, who are not adoptees, and about how primary care doctors respond to this information when their patients walk in the door with direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So obviously not time to go into all this today, but <clears throat> I will uh, uh, point you to that if you're interested. Now, one of the questions I think we've, we've got to address here is clearly genomics is going to be used in the practice of medicine. I think sooner rather than later, but I think we all agree that it's going to be used in the everyday practice of medicine. It's already being used, as I mentioned, in the diagnosis of rare conditions. And in that context has arisen the question of secondary findings. So if I were to sequence every single person in this room, statistically, one of you at least would end up learning that you had a mutation for a fairly highly penetrant condition, usually a cancer predisposition condition or predisposition to hereditary cardiac disease like cardiomyopathy. That, when you scale that up to a population basis, that's a lot of people learning unanticipated information. And that's been the problem and opportunity of what's been named incidental findings or sometimes called secondary findings. So I'll just remind you that uh, the ACMG put together a working group on this that I had the privilege of leading a couple years ago, and we came up with a fairly arbitrary list of 56 genes representing 24 conditions that we recommended should be returned to anyone who's getting sequenced for any reason. And this was uh, something we can talk about later, uh, but it has at least put a flag in the sand of where people can react to it, often critically, uh, but at least it is a place, a starting point for professionals who are now sequencing people in clinical practice and for researchers who are trying to decide when you have a giant registry, when you have a giant biobank, 
and you sequence that giant registry or biobank, what, if anything, should be returned to the research participants who gave you their DNA? <clears throat> well, utilizing genomics in the practice of medicine, we have engaged in another randomized clinical trial we call the MedSeq project. And in this, we are taking people with a genetic condition, in this case cardiomyopathy, and people who are ostensibly healthy, and we are randomizing them to receive whole genome sequencing or standard of care. And I will tell you that one of the most surprising things we learned was how frightened people still are of insurance discrimination. We found that over 20 percent of people declined participation based simply upon their fear that if it was put in their medical records, their insurance companies could get hold of it and differentially charge them. A second critical problem within the MedSeq project and really throughout the practice of genomic medicine has been how do we filter the variants? Each of us has four to five million variants. How do we filter those to find the ones that are truly pathogenic? And this is really perhaps the problem where there is the most opportunity for informatic sharing. And the solution to interpretation has been put forth that we need to connect in federated databases the work of people who are curating these variants within their individual laboratories and institutions. And so, of course, we're very proud that Heidi Rehm is one of the leaders of the ClinGen project, which is serving as, I think, the nation's uh, current uh, resource for collecting and curating these very different variants from many different sources. Heidi often puts up a, um, a slide of shame for the laboratories that have uh, promised to commit resources and to share their data and the laboratories that have not. And that uh, turns out to be very effective at national and international meetings. <clears throat> now, you know, when you think about it, we, we've got to somehow scale genomics across all the practicing doctors in the universe. And one of the things we're trying out in the MedSeq project is a one-page whole genome sequence report. I mean, think about that for a second. Three billion letters, four to five million variants, that entire complex translational interpretation pipeline, and we're going to give it to your doctor in a single-page summary. I'm really proud of this, and we are testing it out in our MedSeq project. The other thing that's really surprising us in the MedSeq project is how many of us are walking around with a risk variant gene. You know, if you take the, the ACMG 56, there's only about 1 percent of us walking around with that. But if you take 4,600 disease-associated genes, it turns out that close to 20 percent of us, based on this little sample, are walking around with a disease-associated risk variant. Not a recessive carrier variant, we've almost all got those, but a dominant or compound heterozygote that actually connotes disease risk. Now, that's pretty amazing, and when you give that back to doctors as we're doing, you can see that they do start st spending more time and they do start spending more money on the patients that, that come before them with this information. So there's no question that integrating genomics into the overall practice of medicine will cost more. The only question is, will the value that we glean out of that justify the increased cost? And finally, from my money, the, the place that's most ripe for shared informatics is the fundamental question in genomic medicine right now, which is related to the question of variant interpretation, and that is the global question of what is the penetrance of all these disease-associated variants. So if I find uh, a, a cardiomyopathy disease gene variant in you and you live to 100 without ever getting it, how is that different from finding it in you where you're going to get it at age 24? What are the parameters? Why has that happened? And how do we get better at predicting what this is? And I'll show you some unpublished data that I'm very excited about where we took all the people we could get in the public domain who had been sequenced as part of the Framingham Heart Study and part of the Jackson Heart Study, and we looked at the phenotypes that had developed in them over 20 years in the Framingham Heart Study and over a much shorter period of time in the Jackson Heart Study, 
and we looked to see if those mutations were expressing themselves. And just as a starting point, we took the 56 ACMG mutations, uh, I mean genes, <clears throat> and we saw that in all cases there was a statistically significant increase in the clinical features associated with the respective genes. You were six times more likely here, you were close to five times more likely here. Both were done prospectively, independently, and uh, the, uh, both are highly significant. So we're holding our breath as this gets reviewed and hoping that it's published soon. But it starts to speak to the question that if you wait long enough, particularly over 20 years, and you take a subset of genes that are supposed to have a high penetrance in families where you've seen a strong family history, this may be useful as, as some sort of population screening as well. How useful it's going to be, of course, depends on what kind of intervention we can do as well as simply what we're finding. I'll finish up by saying that we're, we're also doing the BabySeq project, which is doing a similar randomized trial in newborn babies. Uh, we've just started recruiting for that. I'll be able to tell you more about that next time I speak to you. Uh, in doing so, I've become very aware of the conflicting and often uh, mythical forces exerted by the FDA and the IRBs. I'm very grateful to the NIH for supporting uh, our work in this area. And uh, for those of you who are interested in this, we are hiring genetic counselors and project managers, and we are um, delighted to consider collaborations if this has sparked some interest in our data sets from you. Thanks very much. <clears throat>
Um, some other person or firm in the economy comes up with an idea of how to develop a diagnostic test or a pharmaceutical drug that's based on that gene which Solera holds. And so the question is, do the rules and the governance structures on the Solera gene affect the likelihood that that diagnostic test or that pharmaceutical treatment will ever be developed into a product that ha consumers have access to? And so the context for how I collected data to try to study that empirically is that I basically traced out the history of the human genome sequencing effort, both by the Human Genome Project and by Solera, to try to isolate what you would think of as a, a natural experiment. So something that could mimic a randomized control trial where some genes were always in the public domain and some genes were held with this proprietary database access set of rules that Solera had. And so to give you a sense for how I came up with structuring that study, it's just useful to review the timeline of what happened when Solera and the Human Genome Project were trying to do their sequencing efforts. So the Human Genome Project launched first um, around 1990. Solera was uh, founded later in 1998. And both of them had the same goal, which is that they both wanted to sequence all of the genes in the human genome. So Solera began its sequencing in September of 1999. And then in 2001, uh, the sequencing of the human genome was declared complete. And so what that means is that Solera and the Human Genome Project both published a version of their sequenced genome, Solera in Science and the Human Genome Project in Nature. There was a big press conference sort of announcing that the genome had been sequenced. In practice, neither of those efforts was complete as of that date. So that 2001 date was essentially a convenient date for a press conference between Tony Blair and uh, President Clinton. And that was sort of uh, a public face on saying the sequenced genome has been completed. But so the fact that neither of them were complete means the following. So when the Human Genome Project sequenced its data, they put all of its data in the public domain within 24 hours. That was under something called the Bermuda Rules. So it was a very aggressively open access stance, which was not without controversy. So some people were concerned that requiring all of the sequence data to be put in the public domain within 24 hours meant that there was not a lot of time for error checking, for example. And so when you think about sort of what's, what does open access mean, I think there is sometimes a tension between quick access to raw data and error and quality checking of that data. And so that's just to say that this was sort of a very aggressive form of open access data, which was um, valued speed potentially over quality checking. What did Solera do? So Solera was essentially a private company that was trying to realize some return on um, its effort to sequence the genome. So the first thing it did is it tried to file for gene patents. So it filed a lot of patent applications, but at that time when most of their data was sequenced, it wasn't sufficient to just have a sequenced gene in order to get a gene patent. You actually needed to know something about what that gene did. And so that was because there was a change around 2000 or 2001 where the US Patent and Trademark Office increased the utility requirement for gene patents so that you needed to be able to say something about what that gene did in the human body, at least speculatively, in order to get your patent application be granted a patent. So it turns out Solera didn't have any idea of what its genes did. It just had the sequence data that it had produced. And so almost all of their patent applications were um, not granted. So the patent office can't reject your patents, but the none, basically none of them were granted. And so what Solera did is they hired um, a really smart lawyer, and they essentially said, we're not going to be able to get these gene patents. Can you structure us something that will be able to allow us to capture some return on our investment in the absence of being able to have patent protection? And so what this lawyer came up with is something that is sort of complicated to explain, but it's essentially you know, a combination of like a shrink wrap license like you would get on a piece of software and just some contract law tools which outline various restrictions on how people could use their data. So Solera um, published their draft genome in science. As part of that deal for publishing in science, they had to make their data open, openly available. And so the way that they did that is you could go to a website, which was linked to on the science um, journal, uh, and y you could basically look at the genome online. If you actually wanted to get access to the data that underlined their science article, you needed to basically send in a request to the company saying, I would like to get access to your data, and they would send you a data DVD free of charge with no restrictions on whether you could publish papers based on their data. And so in that sense, this was actually like perceived as by many people as quite a lenient policy. So academics could get access to the data uh, for free with no restrictions on their publication. 
And what you had to sign is an agreement that said, I understand that I can't redistribute this data. So that's similar to the software license where you know, you're not supposed to buy Microsoft Office and then copy it and resell it to other people. And I understand that if I want to develop a commercial product using that data, I need to come back and negotiate a licensing agreement with Solera. Okay, so there were restrictions both on redistribution and on um, commercial development, but not on academic publications. And so that was basically what Solera's intellectual property rights were. They didn't have patents, but they had this form of uh, proprietary contracts that they used to try to make some money off of their databases. And so Solera decided at that point in 2001 when they published their data that it wasn't worth it to them to sort of finish sequencing the human genome. What they decided is they wanted to just move on to trying to develop new products based on the genes that they had sequenced and to realize the returns from people that would come back and negotiate these licensing agreements with them. And so the Human Genome Project, on the other hand, wanted to complete a finished version of the genome that would be documented in its entirety. And so they kept going on their sequencing effort until they had sequenced all of the DNA in the human genome. And so what that means is, is essentially in 2001, there were some genes that had only been sequenced by the Human Genome Project. Those were in the public domain. There were some that had been sequenced both by the Human Genome Project and by Solera. And there were some that had only been sequenced by Solera, but that would get resequenced by the Human Genome Project as the Human Genome Project continued its efforts. And so what you have is this group of genes that were temporarily held with Solera's proprietary data uh, rights, but which eventually got transferred into the public domain. And the reason why that happened is because, exactly because Solera didn't have a patent. So normally if you have a patent and someone redevelops the same idea, you can still exclude them from entering the market because that's the right that a patent gives you. But this sort of hybrid form of contract law and, and contractual obligations that Solera had wasn't robust to rediscovery. So as soon as the Human Genome Project resequenced these genes that were held with Solera's intellectual property, those immediately were transferred into the public domain. Okay? And so as of 2003, all of Solera's genes were in the public domain, and that was actually completely expected. So you can get quotes from Craig Venture, you know, the head of Solera, in 2001, when they were selling their data to pharmaceutical firms and biotech companies and scientific labs, saying, everyone knows our data is going to be in the, in the public domain in two years, they just don't want to have to wait for it. So it's not that this was like a surprise to people that Solera's data was all in the public domain in two years. Everyone knew that, and Solera was able to still have a somewhat successful business model um, selling their data during that time period. Okay, so that's sort of the institutional context for um, how I thought about trying to design a study to understand what was the impact of Solera's intellectual property on whether genes ended up getting used in scientific research and product development. And so in order to match that institutional context with some data, I just wanted to give you a sense of what kinds of data sets I put together to try to um, answer that question. And so this is just for one example, which is a gene called RAX2. So if you use the NCBI databases or any of the NIH databases, you'll notice that genes and RNA sequences all have the equivalent of like a social security number. So they have unique identifiers, um, which are things that basically make it possible to link across databases so that you know this gene was studied in this scientific paper and was also the same gene that was used in this diagnostic test and was this gene, you know, when, it, when was it sequenced by the Human Genome Project? And so Basically, I structure my data set around using those identification numbers to try to trace genes throughout different parts of this process. So under uh, the Bermuda rules, when the Human Genome Project required that all of the data be put in the public domain within 24 hours, it turns out that you can get a record of when specific genes were uploaded to this open access database based on the history of the website. And so that was very useful for me because it basically gave me a record of when the Human Genome Project sequenced all of these genes. And so it turns out this RAX2 gene was sequenced by the Human Genome Project in 2001. So then I needed to know, was this gene initially held with Solera's intellectual property or was it first sequenced by the Human Genome Project? So essentially what you'd want to know to know the answer to that is you'd want to take a version of Solera's sequenced genome and compare it with um, the Human Genome Project sequenced genome in 2001 and say, was this gene only in Solera's data and not yet sequenced by the Human Genome Project? So that's actually for 
someone with like expertise, so probably everyone in this room except for me, not that hard of a thing to do. Like you would do a, a blast search and compare them and then you would know. So it turns out for an economist, that's like not an easy thing to do. And so um, luckily for me, I wrote to some of the scientists that were at Solera and I sort of said, oh, this is what I'd like to do. Do you have like an idea of, of how I might do that? And what they pointed me to is there was actually a paper that was published that did exactly that comparison because essentially Solera scientists were interested in who won the race. So they wanted to know who sequenced more data. And the appendix tables to this paper just detailed a list of here's the genes that were only in Solera's data and the genes that were only in the Human Genome Project data. So even as an economist, I can take their appendix tables and like put them into my data set. So, but just to say, it's not, it's not like a huge scientific advance to be able to, to do that stuff, but for me, it was not possible. So, okay, and then I wanna look at all of the genes that were either sequenced by Solera or sequenced by the Human Genome Project to try to ask how did they get used by scientists and how did they get used by um, either academics or commercial firms that were trying to develop tests, um, genetic tests for consumers. And so this gene, it turns out, was studied in um, s several publications. Um, one of them was published in Human Molecular Genetics in 2004, and they were uh, these papers were arguing that that gene had links to at least two different conditions. One is age-related macular degeneration, and a second is a different vision condition called Coonrod dystrophy. And so what I did is I tried to track both the scientific publications and the number of phenotypes that each gene was linked to as a measure of how much effort were scientists putting in to try to study these genes and figure out what kinds of phenotypes those genes were related to. And then I used a, um, a non-mandatory but widely used genetic testing registry called genetest.org, which basically you can just search these ID numbers and say, is there a genetic test being offered based on the RAX2 gene ID number? And it turns out that there was an age-related macular degeneration test available as of 2009. And so then I can say this gene had a test available based on, based on that phenotype. So all of that data is just descriptively interesting, at least to me, because it sort of gives a timeline of progression of what the important um, t uh, sequences of discovery were for this gene. So when was it sequenced? When was it studied by scientists? When did we learn something about it? And when was it actually used in a product that consumers had access to? And so given that data, you can do various tabulations to try to ask the question, did this proprietary um, form of intellectual property that Solera had over its genes discourage follow-on scientific research and follow-on commercial investment relative to if those genes had been in the public domain with the other Human Genome Project genes the entire time. And so the, the most basic cut of data that you uh, can do for that is essentially all of Solera's genes were sequenced in 2001. And what I did is I just tabbed um, what are the follow-on innovation outcomes for Solera's genes relative to genes that were sequenced by the Human Genome Project in 2001. So if you think of sequencing as sort of the start of a new ability to do research on a gene, all of these genes were sequenced at the same time, but one was held with Solaris proprietary rights and one was in the public domain. And so then I wanna look over the subsequent, you know, nine or 10 years, what happened to those genes? And so it turns out that Solaris genes had many fewer publications. They were much less likely to be linked to a phenotype either one that was uncertain or one that was relatively certain as coded by a, a National Institutes of Health database. And Solera genes were also much less likely to be used in medical diagnostic tests relative to these genes that were in the public domain. And so that's a comparison that, um, you know, uh, on its own is potentially not that informative. And w what's the concern? The concern is just, we don't have a randomized experiment where some genes were Solera's genes and some genes were the Human Genome Project genes. And so, you know, in the one and a half hour version of this talk or the 87 page paper, which I'm happy to send you if you would like to read about it, essentially what I try to do is to say, was there selection into which genes were Solaris genes and which genes were the Human Genome Project genes once you condition on some things like the year that the genes were sequenced? And it turns out that there is some evidence of selection, but you can isolate comparisons in the data that look like they circumvent those selection concerns, and you basically get the same bottom line as what you get from this basic comparison, where it looks like Solera's genes have about 20 to 30 percent um, lower scientific research and lower commercial development relative to comparable genes that were sequenced at the same time, but were always in the public domain. And so. Um, just to give you some sense of the kinds of comparisons that uh, I, I put together for that. So these are uh, two sets of Solera genes. Um, all of Solera genes were sequenced in 2001. Some of them were resequenced by the public sector in 2002, and others of them were resequenced by the public sector in 2003. And so if you look at this graph, 
In 2001, both of those cohorts were held by Solera. And so you'd want to see that in 2001, when they didn't differ, they had the same number of publications on those genes. And in fact, that number is quite similar across the two groups. Then you have some of those Solera genes became public in 2002, and consistent with Solera's proprietary rights interfering with scientific research, you see an uptick in the number of publications in those genes the year that they moved into the public domain. Similarly, with the second cohort of Solera genes that came into the public domain in 2003, you see an uptick in publications for those Solera genes when they moved into the public domain in 2003. Um, what's notable about this graph is eventually these two groups of genes converged in the rate at which scientists were studying those genes. So it looks essentially like when you're held with this proprietary form of, of database protection, um, you see an uptick in your research when you move to the public domain, but then eventually it looks like you get studied about the same amount as other genes. That's sort of a flow measure of research effort. This is trying to get at a different question, which is what's the stock of knowledge that we've accumulated about Solera's genes? Um, relative to similar genes that were held with this proprietary database protection for a shorter period of time. And so the outcome variable here is just, is there a, a, a known but uncertain phenotype? So this is one measure of, have we seen a connection between this gene and some phenotype uh, or disease that we think it's related to? So again, in 2001, both cohorts of genes were held in Solaris and Electra property, and you see a similar likelihood that those two genes, uh, those, those two sets of genes, were um, part of a known phenotype. In 2002, the first cohort went public, and you actually see an uptick in the likelihood that there's a conjectured phenotype for those genes, even in the first year that they're in the public domain. The most important thing to point out about this graph is that there's no catch up over time um, through the end of the data, which is 2009 for this study. And so what that means is that the difference between these two cohorts of genes is that one was held with Solaris and Electra property for one additional year. And it looks like through the end of the data that I had when I completed the study, that resulted in a persistent difference in the likelihood that that gene had a known phenotype through the end of the data. And so one way of quantifying this is to say, I can't reject it as if a gene being held with proprietary data uh, rights is as if we just have a lost year of research that will never get caught up once that gene moves into the public domain. And what I would stress again is that this is not an incredibly closed model like the Myriad model. This is a relatively open hybrid model where people did have access to the data and could publish without restrictions, but we're still seeing these very persistent effects of this form of proprietary database protection on subsequent follow-on research. And so this is my last slide, but what I want to come back to is what I started with at the beginning, which is to say, this is not answering the question of whether proprietary database protection is good or bad, because essentially we're not answering the question of was society better off because Solera came in and tried to do its sequencing effort for the human genome. So in this particular case study, you may just think, well, we had a very good substitute to Solera sequencing the data, which is that the Human Genome Project was doing the same thing. And so you know, would that data have been provided anyway? The answer is yes. And so here, the question that you would need to think about is, did Solera's entry spur the Human Genome Project to complete its, its work more quickly? And sort of did we get all of the sequence data accessed to society more quickly than if Solera never would have entered? Um, the Human Genome Project is on record explicitly saying that they didn't speed up their effort. So you may think that in this case study we know, we know that answer. But I think what's more of interest is just in general, not just for this case study, do the prospects of having proprietary rights over databases encourage firms to make investments that wouldn't happen otherwise? And that's something I don't know the answer to. I haven't sort of been able to come up with a way of using the existing institutions and the existing data to shed light on that question. But I do um, conjecture that there often is a trade-off where um, proprietary databases probably do provide some incentives for private firms to develop new databases, and that there is often a trade-off because those proprietary proprietary databases, as in this example, can have negative effects on follow-on innovation. And so optimal policy essentially requires having empirical estimates of the magnitude of both of those effects so that you can think about how to trade them off in a way that results in the best benefit to society. Um, but uh, that's, like I said, not something I have an overall answer on. It's more just to say, um, I think this is a very important topic, and I think it's one where we need data and empirical research to try to inform how we think about optimal design of policies and institutions. Okay, thank you. So, where am I supposed to sit?
Come on up, guys, because I don't have any slides. I don't have any slides, and I, I will talk from here, and then we'll just very s gently s seg into a, uh, a panel discussion. Um, the, the whole idea of creating an, an information commons that's relevant to uh, the new technologies of genomics, and actually it's not just genomics, it's also medical imaging and laboratory results of various kinds. Um, just, I, I want to put this in a bit of context um, and, and set the, the stage for the subsequent discussion here. In the last two years, the President of the United States has made two announcements in his State of the Union address that bear directly on the discussion that we're having today. Last year, he announced the formation of the Precision Medicine Initiative that you all have undoubtedly heard of, which is uh, it's, it's partly a new infusion of enthusiasm and uh, funding streams for um, taking advantage of the new technologies that are available um, and trying to translate the new knowledge that's being created out of genomics and other fields and incorporate it into medical practice and take advantage of the precision that can be added by having um, information about what's going on within cells and at the level all the way down to human genes. So, and then this year, um, the announcement was about the so-called National Cancer Moonshot, uh, which we can debate whether that was a smart framework for, for uh, pitching this, but the idea is that one of the places, one of the places where the wave is breaking for incorporating genomic information into clinical practice is oncology. Um, and that's partly because uh, we've always cared a whole lot about cancer, and there's always been a lot of, there have been many resources devoted to cancer. It's by far the dread disease, way more than even Alzheimer's disease, mental disorders, or cardiovascular disease. That may or may not be an accurate perception on the part of the public, but it's real, and it drives policy. So that's partly it, but it's also the fact that, in fact, oncology is a field is the place where understanding cellular biology and molecular biology has begun to have clinical impact so that instead of just trying to figure out which tissue was the source of this tumor that's growing somebody's body, we are actually now beginning to look at which genes are turned on in the cells that actually we know are um, cancerous in that patient's body, and then directing therapy at the mutations that are identified by using the new genomic technologies. So the, the cancer moonshot is building on the fact that that's where the wave is breaking in genomics. These characteristics have, uh, th these two new programs have three characteristics that I think are distinctive. One is they rely on the new whiz-bang high-tech stuff that we do in biology that we didn't used to be able to do. We can generate information about imaging and about um, genomic, individual genomic information in a way that we simply couldn't, the main reason being that the sequencing technologies have dropped by six orders of magnitude in the last decade and how expensive it is. So I've had several of you actually, I, don't, I, I couldn't see in the back of the room how many of you raised your hand about having had your genome sequenced, um, but that would have been completely unthinkable when it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do somebody's genome, which it did when we had, when Heidi's slides began uh, with the Human Genome Project, it was a big deal, a really big deal with capital BD um, to sequence a genome, a reference genome, and now we can do it uh, in a matter of uh, a week, sometimes even a day at a, at a high throughput lab and at a cost of something on the order of, uh, you know, just to do the raw sequencing, $1,000 if you do the interpretation of it, maybe another uh, two and a half to three times that cost. So what that means is we're doing a lot of it, um, and we're doing a lot of it in on oncology because the treatments for oncology are really expensive and harrowing, and um, it is worth trying to figure out what's going on biologically before you initiate the therapies. Therefore, the diagnostics are high value. So all of this stuff is, uh, so it's high-tech whiz-bang. It depends on transfer of information through the digital networks that have emerged. So think about it, when the Human Genome Project started in 1990, there was no World Wide Web. The way that people contributed data from their laboratories into GenBank and the DNA sequencing uh, databases was usually they published a paper 
and the people at the databases would type the data from the papers into the databases by hand. Um, and uh, so the first genome sequencing projects were actually grad students looking at gels and typing things in by hand, and that has clearly changed. The digital technologies are every bit as important as the um, biological uh, technologies for managing large amounts of DNA. Um, so we've got these two distinctive features of digitally intensive, comp computationally intensive, and generating lots of data. And the third feature that I think is really interesting um, is that there is a serious premium being put on engaging the people who have concerns about the use of the data. So patient advocacy organizations, disease advocacy organizations are being very, taken very seriously and are, they're trying to incorporate that in these two initiatives into the process of planning them and deciding how to deploy resources and how to structure things. So now what does all that got to do with the medical information commons? Well, let me see if I can begin to tease out some of the policy questions that are going to emerge in taking seriously the fact that we want these new technologies to actually make a difference in improving and lengthening the lives of the human beings on this planet. In order to m achieve the goals of any sort of precision medicine, the scale of the research has gone to a point where no institution can capture and exploit the data that they're going to be generating. That means that data have to be shared in order to capture the benefits of these new initiatives. And yet, if you think about it, the structures that we've got in place to make sure that we can do that are, uh, I, I don't want to say primitive because they aren't primitive, they're very sophisticated, but they were designed for the purposes for which they were built. And the purposes for which most of the data structures were built is to help scientists make new discoveries and publish papers and enhance their careers in a relatively constrained environment. But where is the data coming from now that we're generating f about uh, human genes and uh, human biology? Most of it is not going to show up in scientific publications because most genetic tests are being done on genes that have already been discovered. And the data are created in clinical laboratories or in high-scale uh, research laboratories, but most of it goes into a collection place and it does not actually flow into any of the data structures that are available for public inspection. It stays. The most extreme model of this, of course, is the, the Myriad model, um, where, in fact, Myriad had the proprietary rights to these two, g two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and from the period um, of around 1998 until uh, the lawsuit was filed in 2009, and actually until the lawsuit was decided in June of 2013, pretty much all of us thought that the patents meant that Myriad was the only place in the United States that you could get testing for these two genes. And the patents were being enforced relatively early. So what does that mean? It means that everybody in the United States who was getting genetically tested um, the samples were sent to Myriad Genetics, and the patent rights were for the use and interpretation of the genes, but in fact what that meant is all of the tests in the United States were driven to one purveyor, one, one service uh, operation, one service monopoly. That meant that they saw all the new mutations that nobody else was seeing because they were doing all of the testing. And that is the origin of the database that was created at Myriad. They've done two million tests at Myriad, got the largest database on these two genes uh, on the planet, um, and it's because of their patent monopoly that they've created now a data structure that is proprietary and it's a competitive advantage for them because nobody else has those data in order to in interpret the variants that might be found. Now 98 percent of the time it doesn't matter because 98 percent of the time if you do a test you're going to either find that a variant is well known and it's either well known to be not disease causing or it's well known to be disease causing. But two to three percent of the time, you're going to have a variant that we'd actually, either we haven't seen it before or we don't know how to interpret it because we don't have enough information. Those are the so called variants of unknown significance. And in that case, in those two or three percent of cases, they actually have a big advantage because they've done two million tests and nobody else has. <laughs> 
So that's a, an extreme example of the kind of situation that we find ourselves with. Now, let's generalize that. Um, here are the two genes that have probably been studied about as thoroughly as any two genes in the human genome, with the possible exception of cystic fibrosis and hemoglobin and a few others that have been thoroughly studied over the, over the decades. Um, if you add it all up across the whole globe, there have probably been as many tests administered for BRCA mutations in the rest of the world as there have been at Myriad Genetics. But the difference is, at Myriad, they actually, because of their monopoly, they've built a really good database. And they've kept track of all the information because it came, it flowed to them, and they can actually make interpretations of those. For the whole rest of the world, we have data structures that are, if you go to the national health system in the UK, it depends on which region in the UK you live in, whether you get the test at all, whether it's going to be paid for. If it is done, it'll go to a database that's based in the UK. If you go to Germany, that those data will go to a database that's housed in Germany. If you go to Iceland, you're going to go to either Decode or one of the health system uh, hospitals in, um, in Reykjavik. So what we've got is a pocket of databases all over the world that have information based on the populations that they've been doing testing on, but no way of sharing that information about variants that have been discovered. Um, and the only way that we have of collecting that until very recently has been basically the published literature. Now, two years ago, that began to change, and a database was created at the uh, National Library of Medicine, the National Center for Biotechnology Information called ClinVar that, um, that Robert alluded to in his talk. And the idea of ClinVar is to pool these data from all over and put them in a place where clinicians who are trying to make interpretations of these variants can actually use the best information that's available. The problem is most of the information that's being created in laboratories never gets there. So let me give you two examples of what's going on in the real world right, right now and why this medical information commons is actually much more an aspiration than it is an achievement at this point. Um, I'm involved in a case that's actually based, uh, f f associated with a, a laboratory here in the Boston area. But here's the situation. A child is born in 2006, and uh, he's progressing fine for about four months, and then he has a seizure the day after he gets a vaccine. Um, and that's actually, it's, there's a whole cluster of disorders that are, f f um, th that are provoked by getting fever when you're a, a, a very young infant, um, and it's uh, severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. And it's associated with, there are actually many genes that can be associated with, there are channel defects, there are the, the, the proteins in the cell surface that allow ions, negative or positive ions, to flow through the, the membrane are molecules that can be affected by the mutations. And when they aren't functioning right, they can lead to epilepsy. So, and there is a cluster of these, and there are different channels that can cause the same general uh, phenomenon of getting seizures. Some of them are sodium channels, some of them are other kinds of ions, and you need to know which flavor of the problem it is in order to figure out which treatment to apply. So, um, this child, uh, got a seizure, and a few months later, they decided to examine whether um, this was caused by one of these mutations. A sample was sent off to the laboratory that had patent rights um, to that particular gene, and the result was interpreted as a variant of unknown significance and sent back to the, lat to the clinician with a recommendation that the parents should get tested. Unfortunately, there had been one case reported in the literature, actually two publications, but one case reported in two different publications, uh, of a child with that same mutation who had this horrible syndrome of infantile seizures. But um, to this day, it's now 2016, that case that was reported in 2006 is the only case in literature of finding this mutation in a person and the correlation with this disease. So what we have is a situation, and, and the child had that mutation, did have the syndrome. Um, the mother was never told that. She actually never saw that report until 2014. The child died at age two in January of 2008. 
And that's what has led to a lawsuit. And I have no, uh, I'm an unpaid consultant on this, uh, and I'm, I got pulled into the case because I'm really, really interested in the phenomenon that I'm describing for you all, which is we've got a problem that this was a test done quite appropriately in a clinical laboratory but the information that was generated out of that clinical test, number one, was compared to a database that's completely inadequate to the task of doing global interpretations of what these mutations mean. And to this day, that child's death is not recorded in the medical literature, and the correlation with that clinical syndrome is not reported in the clinical uh, literature to corroborate the fact that it is, in fact, a disastrous mutation in this protein. So we have a serious problem of looping the information from clinical testing into the databases that are needed to interpret the results of the genetic tests that we're doing. And we're going to be finding that. So, so BRCA1 and BRCA2 face the same problem. Myriad every week is coming across mutations that it has never seen. These are genes that have 165,000 base pairs in them, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, and theoretical calculations suggest that if you sampled all the people on the planet Earth, you would find a mutation at almost every position in both of these genes. And we know the clinical significance of only a small minority of those. Now, almost all those mutations are going to be really, really rare. But if you think about it as a system, we need to be able to capture the information from all of the tests that are being done all over the world and pooled into some sort of centralized data structure so we can use that information. That is the central intuition of needing to construct a medical information commons. So I'll finish by just, uh, and just open it up for discussion. Just observe the complicated stuff that I've just talked through and, and the number of kinds of policy issues that are connected to what we have just been discussing here. Number one, does it involve clinical, does it involve scientific structures and how we discover things? Yes, it absolutely does. Does it relate to the incentives that those people who do research um, face in their own careers? Absolutely, right? Why hasn't the information about this child who had a mutation, why hasn't that shown up in the clinical literature? Well, because you can't publish it, because we already know that that gene is associated with the clinical syndrome. You're not going to get a publication based on finding 15 cases that say something that we already know. So our incentive structure is not to capture that. We're not going to capture it through the medical literature or through grants. We have to capture it by having a system that captures the information and makes sure that it gets channeled into public databases. We don't have any incentives for doing that. So, and that's irrespective of the intricacies of this field that is now growing up. Think about it. Um, when uh, the sequencing phase of the Human Genome Project began in 1996, um, Heidi alluded to this. The rule for sharing data at the end of 24 hours, this radical open science uh, policy of sharing data every 24 hours, was put in place in part because everybody wanted this to be an open science initiative. And the leaders of the project, particularly the people who had worked on the nematode worm, which became the scientific structure, that became the, the sociological structure that was used to drive the Human Genome Project. Um, as opposed to, for example, the field that I grew up in, which was cancer genetics and uh, human genetics of Alzheimer's disease, if we had left it to the human geneticists of Alzheimer's disease, we'd still be waiting for the publications to come out. Um, it, there was a very strong norm of not sharing data in human genetics because you would construct a pedigree and you would mine it for the rest of your career. Um, and so. The norm of sharing data came from a, a community of folks that had gotten used to spending a lot of money to create maps and sequences and sharing it with labs all over the world as just a public works project. That, there was an element of that in, in the Bermuda um, decision, but it was also a question of, okay, so we're going to sequence the genome. Somebody has to do chromosome one. Somebody has to do chromosome two. And there, there needed to be a way to allocate the work. And in order to allocate the work, people had to report what data they were actually doing, what, what they were actually doing in their labs. 
and also put it out there in the public so that everybody would know that they were playing by the rules and that the sequence they were producing, they were, producing um, were accurate. Otherwise, everybody's going to say, oh, I want to do all of chromosome 21. I own it. Um, and then they wouldn't necessarily produce. So the open sharing stuff was a combination of the spiritual idea of open science and also some very practical considerations of allocating the work and making sure that it was done with high quality standards. In, and the only way to do that was to make sure that everybody could see the data. In 1996, when that happened, what were the structures that were in place? Well, for 10 years, starting in 1984, the places that the data would be deposited, GenBank, the DD, DNA database of Japan, and the uh, European database, EMBL base, had already got a decade of sharing data daily between themselves. So the data structures were already there to share the data. And there was really only one company that mattered. And it was the company that was manufacturing the instruments. And it was feeding both sides of the uh, arms race. Solera was a spin out of the company that produced the sequencing instrument that was used by both the Public Genome Project and by the Solera team that was sequencing the genome at the same time. That was really the only company that really mattered at that time. There were spin-out companies for finding genes and stuff like that, a half dozen of them at the time. But in fact, the only company that was deeply ingrained in the science was uh, the company that produced the instrument supplied biosystems. So fast forward to 2016. What's the difference between the norms of sharing and all that in Bermuda in 1996 compared to what's changed today? Well, number one, in 1996, the United States and the United Kingdom paid for 90 percent of the Human Genome Project. And what NIH, the Department of Energy, and the Wellcome Trust said became policy de facto. And you could get 50 people in a room to decide a set of rules about how they're going to share data, and you would have all the people that were going to be contributing the data represented in that room. Now, we have literally hundreds of companies. Some of them are software companies. Some of them are instrument companies. Some of them are DNA sequencing service companies. We've got a half dozen varieties of companies and hundreds of them pursuing different lines of research. It's a way more complicated commercial um, uh, landscape that's out there. More, company, more countries are involved. Uh, the Broad Institute is probably the largest genome institute on the planet. But the, uh, what used to be the Beijing Genome Institute is now in Shenzhen in uh, China, is probably number two in its uh, sequencing capacity. It may even be number one, I don't know. Um, so things have gotten much more global, much more international. We've got national genome projects growing up in almost every country uh, at various stages of repair. It's a much more international data sharing problem that we face. Um, so we've got commercial stuff. And we've got international stuff. And um, we've got a huge problem in that the data are now flowing not just from a handful of research labs, but most of the data that are going to be generated about human genomic uh, variation is going to be flowing through labs that are actually doing their work either for consumer genomics and people interested in their ancestry or for some other reason. Or more commonly, it's going to be connected to clinical sequencing that's going to a laboratory that is reporting its results back to a doctor. And we're back to this problem that we don't have the loops of sharing information that will allow us to interpret genomic variation over time because we haven't built the infrastructure and the sharing norms that are needed to make sure that we can interpret that information over time. We have not built a learning system. That is the central intuition of the report that came out in 2011 from the National Research Council, the report that became the template for President Obama's announcement last year. That's probably enough to get started with a discussion and open it up for questions. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I, think, I think we should do that, actually. So it's, it's, uh, we've got about five minutes left in our scheduled time, although I'm happy to also stay over a few extra minutes if there's, if there's substantial discussion. But I, I just want to see if anybody wanted to bring up a question. Maybe I'll bring a mic over. There you go. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned there about incentives to share things, and I know with clinicaltrials.gov and the underreporting going on there, um, that's another closely related area where do there need to be more incentives? 
So I, I would be interested in hearing more about that. Why don't we pick up a couple more questions we can kind of collectively answer, sure. and this will be a little more efficient, I think. Yeah, I had um, two questions. What First is what you think the likelihood of reconciling national policies on data sharing. I work at the Broad, and we're finding it even harder now to get European data into dbGaP. Um, so what, what the chances are that there'll be progress across international lines on that front. And then also what you think about the notion of patients um, requesting data that's been clinically sequenced um, through the CLIA laws, requesting their own data and then making that data available via a public database. Is that something that sounds feasible? You know, we've heard about this before and I just don't know, you know, what the likelihood of kind of a patient-driven um, effort to get that data out of clinical private sequencing labs and into the public domain, if that's something that's um, something you see as, as likely or feasible. Okay. And then we'll do, we'll do one more and then we'll get some responses. My question is, why are we uh, incentivizing uh, genetic discoveries by giving rights to exclude others from using the findings? There are other ways to incentivize economic activities, give them money, give them intellectual property rights over things that matter to us less, things of that sort. So, so I'll take a stab at those and, and we'll just open it up. So. Um, on the international stuff, I think it's going to be really complicated because I, I mentioned that the Bermuda rules were imposed. Well, they were imposed by the U.S. and the U.K. because the leaders of those two, those three funding institutions basically agreed it was good policy. It actually, even at the time, conflicted with national policy in Germany and Japan, and they had to write some nasty letters saying, you know what, you don't get to play in our, in our you don't get to call yourself part of the Human Genome Project unless you play by our rules. Um, what was going on in Germany and Japan is the companies in those countries were supposed to get privileged access to the data that were generated in that country. Um, and I think we're beginning to see biotech is associated quite strongly with genomics. And every nation is developing a policy structure for capturing the value of genomics under the rubric of biotechnology and, in addition, because of the international treaty regimes, we're creating obligations, uh, and many countries have now passed laws about transferring samples or information across national borders that are going to make this way more complicated than it would have been in 1996. Um, so I think it is going to be a real challenge. Um, to the question about are there other incentives, there absolutely are. Most of the incentives for discovery are if you ask scientists, the premium is actually on reputation and being first and, and all that. The fact is, though, I think we've got a relatively unsophisticated way of thinking about intellectual property and patents. And my conclusion after studying this stuff for about 12 years is the debate has tended to center on one question, and it is an important question, which is what sort of thing is patentable at all? Is patenting a good idea or not? And my sense, after studying this for about 12 years, is that's actually not the most important question most of the time. The most important question is much more, what do you do with the rights that you've got? And how exactly do you decide in the legal system to grant those exclusive rights? And how broad should those rights reach? And that's the debate that I think, uh, so, so and, and, and let me explain why I think that's tr true. I think patents actually do serve a social end. That's why we have them, in that they induce private investment on top of a layer of public investment that we can put into R&D. They do that in a very special context where it requires extra investment to develop the thing that you've got into something that's actually going to turn into a commercial product or, or, or service. It's an inducement to additional private investment, and you need it becomes the way of preventing free riders from benefiting from your expenditures, your research expenditures in the private context. Sometimes that's going to prevail, even in diagnostics and certainly in therapeutics. And I think that patents are one way to do that. Data exclusivity is another way. But there are all sorts of tools that we have for creating incentives. But what I don't think we have is a very robust theory of 
how and in what conditions you should grant rights of what breadth, and what is the right tool for of what form of intellectual property is most appropriate for this kind of situation. It's not very nuanced, it's not very granular, and it's kind of one, it's, it's a very broad brush that we're painting when we're talking about patent rights. And I think that's actually the conceptual flaw in our system that those of us who study this stuff need to be doing most of our hard work to do. And, and Heidi's work is actually a, a beautiful example of that kind of nuanced ex uh, analysis, I think. Can I just follow up and ask you and, and Heidi, what do you think about the Genomics England model? which as I understand it, they have created teams of academicians which they have pre-vetted, and those teams can get sort of unfettered, unpaid access to the data, and then if you are a company, you pay a, a, a much more uh, robust fee. Is that kind of hybrid model a good model for the future? That's pretty close to what the Solera model was. Mm. Um, mm. And it, it's very useful for certain contexts. Uh, but every set of eyes that you shut out of the data, you're paying a price for future exploitation. Um, so this is what, I don't think we have the theories that allow us to make these trade-offs in a nuanced way. That's why I love, Heidi, the fact that you're trying to examine the questions that help us think about what the trade-offs are. Because um, those trade-offs are very real. But yeah, th there are many, many models, and I actually think we're going to kind of stumble our way in. We're going to have lots of models out there in the real world that are going to be tried. So will PMI be wide open? No. There's no way that that's going to happen. PMI is going to be a hybrid of, of 45 zillion kinds of ways of sharing data and different levels of consortia and all that. We do have this aspirational model of creating a medical information commons that truly is open and on which everybody can draw. And there will be an element of that. And I, my own bias is the more of that that we create, the more productive and fast progress will be. But um, there's just no way that this is all going to be in that space. So Because the cultures and the constraints. Because the culture about. and also because the data are about human beings. And we have real, not just virtual, we have very real concerns about privacy. and contractual obligations, not just informed consent, but things that we've agreed to that we have to abide by mm -hmm. further down the line. So it's not, it can't be open. It can't be completely open. There are just too many, uh, these data are about real human beings. Um, and we're just not going to have something. The Bermuda principle was, the, the Bermuda rules worked in part because the data were not supposed to be identifiable and we were creating a reference sequence. Um, and if they hadn't been, in fact, there was a fateful choice made in the, in the mid-1990s to not sequence, not make the reference sequence a particular human being who had actually answered an ad for the group that was studying chromosome 19 for the Department of Energy, we would have known exactly who the sequence was from if we had used the clones that were originally produced um, for the mapping efforts. Um, and they hit a reset button saying, ooh, 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 we don't want to do that we would have had another Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks situation where we would have known the very person on whom the reference genome was sequenced unless we had actually taken a policy intervention. That was Francis Collins and a bunch of people saying, oops, we better not go there, um, and realizing that error. So the privacy considerations are, are very real and the, the informed consent issues are very real. Yeah, I'll just follow up on the, the first question about incentives for sharing. I think a, my read of the historical evidence is that uh, Compliance with requests to share data is going to be quite low in the absence of requirements by regulators or incentives for them to actually do that in practice. And so, it, how how does that usually happen? You know, it can happen through NIH funding being conditional on um, submitting data to certain repositories. It can happen through um, firms that want to sell their projects to the consumer. Um, going through FDA regulations and the FDA having requirements at the point of regulating access to new diagnostic tests. So I think I'm not advocating for those to be the right thing to do, but I think just based on the historical record, voluntary sharing oftentimes just does not uh, result in the level of compliance that we would need. Yeah, so the, the fundamental problem is sharing costs, costs time and energy and, and all that, and that's the biggest reason that it doesn't happen. Um, a lot of there are actually a lot of tools for encouraging sharing once you get the clinical sequencing. I think for scientific purposes, the sharing norms, if we actually abided by Mertonian science in all the journals and forced these rules that already exist, that are basically, if you're publishing something and 
your conclusions are based on the data, you have to share the data sufficient for us to replicate what you've said. Now, that's abided by only spottily, but if we actually took that seriously, that's a solution to the scientific problem of constructing Mertonian science. When it comes to clinical stuff, there actually are several levers. Payers could say, we're not going to pay for this test unless we can build a system that over time we know that that test can be independently verified. You can't tell us you've got a proprietary database. Trust us, we're getting the, giving you the right answer. You could say, we're not going to pay for the test unless it can be clinically validated. You could accredit the laboratories and say, you only get accredited if you're sharing data in such a way that your results can be verified by other laboratories. You can certify them under CLIA to say, this is a condition of getting CLIA certification so you can get paid by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and you could make it a regulatory condition. FDA is thinking about this. I don't think they know where they're going to come out on it. But the fact is, FDA is going to be approving all sorts of genetic tests that are measurements of genetic variation. They need to be able to say they can't approve one test at a time for all 22,000 genes in the genome. They're going to have to have a regulatory grade data structure out there that they can rely on that's used for interpretation of those variants. And one of the things that they could do as a condition of regulation is to say, your data have to be, you either show us the data period at FDA, or you have to transmit your data into a public database in such a way that we can be sure that it's being curated and validated um, under the eyes of many other experts. So those are many levers that are out there that haven't been pulled yet. It, it appears almost that, they're, that FDA is trying to n sort of crawl their way in that direction um, with regard to ClinVar. So for example, in the BabySeq project, they decided to practice regulating on us as an IDE, an investigational device exemption, which had never been done before for any set of clinical sequencing projects. And one of the things they asked us was, how are you going to interpret your variants? And what they wanted was a structure. They wanted some sort of resource in place to guide the interpretation of our variants. So we were able to actually point at a certain point to ClinVar and to the standards for uh, curation and agreement on curation in ClinVar as a principled umbrella under which they were able to then go forward and accept that component of our IDE submission. So uh, I think that, that, that aligns very nicely with what you're, what you're suggesting as one of the me yeah. mechanisms for incentivizing um, sharing. But I think the thing to observe about this, this is all work in progress. And these are norms that have not been construction at, constructed or, or, or even very much articulated. And the infrastructure for doing all this stuff simply does not exist. And it's very uncomfortable to be in the middle of it when you're trying to run a clinical research study from a scientific perspective. I mean, it, it, it essentially paralyzed our effort on BabySeq for close to a year and uh, pushed us into a, a regulatory region we had no experience or expertise in whatsoever. So it was very, very uncomfortable for us, for our institution, for NHGRI, the Child Institute, for pretty much everybody involved. Um, and as you said, nobody funded us to struggle with that component of it. So actually, I, I wanted to um, ask Heidi, also, the alternatives for setting up the, 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 the very insightful question from the back about exclusive rights don't have to be the only way that we set up incentives for making discoveries and translate, translating them into practice. As an economist, how, how can you help us think about this, the alternative ways other than this classic patent system of creating exclusive rights for an invention that meets certain criteria? Um, I mean, I think what the, what the historical record suggests is that firms will use the existing set of incentives and regulations to the best of their advantage uh, to get a private return on their investment. And so I think the Solera example that I talked about is actually just a really nice case of that, where they tried to get patents, their patents were rejected, and then they sort of pulled together like whatever other levers were available to try to get a profit, profitable return on their investment. And so. I think there are many, many alternatives to the patent system and many alternatives to awarding firms exclusivity. Um, in practice, uh, it seems like the ones that firms default to when we limit their 
ability to patent may not result in the social gains that we would want. And so I think this comes back to what Bauke Dima was talking about with are things patentable? So a lot of the recent Supreme Court cases around gene patents have declared that certain kinds of genes um, should, should not be patentable. Certain kind of genetic data should not be patentable. And I think what the Supreme Court has in mind when they say that is that um, this data is going to be in the public domain if it's not patentable. And I think that's not the right counterfactual. The right counterfactual is if firms can't get patents, how are they going to try to protect their investments in the absence of patents? And in the Solera case, it looks like they, they did something which, based on some unpublished research that I have, looks worse than if we would have just let them get patents in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like patents actually have less of a deterrent effect on follow-on innovation than does this package of proprietary contractual rights that Solera used in the absence of being able to get patents. And so I think we just need much more of a nuanced empirical understanding of what are the set of options that are available to firms that they'll use if we sort of put limitations on them being able to have patent protection or have sort of other forms of monopoly rights. And it's just not clear a priori that we're going to be better off as a society by limiting firms' potential to patent. It could be that in other contexts we are, um, but it's just, it's not, um, it's not obvious, I think, in the absence of some data on that. So. So maybe we'll take one more set of questions and then and then close up. Does, it, does anybody else want to ask any? Thank you. Um, I was wondering, none of you had mentioned the WHO as a sort of arbiter of um, a database or having any role in discussing any of this process. I know that with clinicaltrials.gov, it ultimately just ended up being an NLM effort. And you had mentioned that the NLM is now um, potentially going to be our primary repository, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the role of the WHO or other um, more international collaborations. Yeah, it's funny. I was sitting at WHO uh, working there the summer that the press conference announcing the, the Human Genome Project completion, the kind of the pseudo deadline that Heidi alluded to in her uh, Thing. I was working there at the time. Um, I think WHO is notorious, is conspicuous for its absence in a lot of these. Uh, WHO did do a report on genomics and world health um, in, in 2000. And it's a very good report. Uh, it's quite skeptical about patents. Um, but they were trying to play a role. But the fact is, WHO is a thoroughly under resourced international organization. And if I were identifying a flaw in our system, um, I would say the number one flaw is the lack of infrastructure at the national level. We just haven't developed the structures that will capture the data because we are really, really good at pursuing innovative science and peer-reviewed R01 investigator research. We suck at developing, excuse me for the term, but I mean we suck at building infrastructure that's going to be robust and long-term with a few singular exceptions. Like think of the world without Index Medicus and now PubMed. And that's the world that we're sailing into with genomics is that we don't have that stuff. Um, and maybe the structures will build out, but observe ClinVar is funded by a single national institution, the National Institutes of Health, um, that in and of itself doesn't particularly like supporting infrastructure. Um, and I just don't feel, it doesn't feel to me like that's a stable long-term solution. I don't think people in China are going to be completely happy or in Korea or Japan are going to be completely happy saying all the information about human genomic variation is going to end up in ClinVar, which is owned and operated by the federal government, which Edward Snowden told us maybe isn't so trustworthy. Through a grant mechanism. By the way, yeah. through, a, through, a fun, through a competitive grant mechanism. So I, I think we've got some structural problems. It would be lovely, it would be totally lovely if we had robust structures at the international level to pull this stuff together. The best thing that we have in this field right now, I think, is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, and they're working really, really hard to pull the stuff together, but it's on a shoestring. And the resource, almost all of the solid resources are either in industry or they're in national funding structures of one way or in, in one way or another. And that's the way science is organized. And I just don't see, it would be lovely if WHO had enough money to actually do its job. But they don't now, and I don't see them filling the gap here when they still have to deal with Ebola and Zika and all the other stuff that is 
front line for them. All right. Well, thank you very much. On that, on that very positive note. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Go have fun.